Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Mike Gendelman. I uh, work at Nomura, which is about a half mile up 8th Avenue, so not too far of a trip for us today. Um, and my colleague, John Humphreys, gave part one of this talk yesterday, Introduction to Spring Boot. So I'm, uh, I'm the architect on the systems management group at Nomura. So we engineer solutions for monitoring and managing all of the systems at Nomura. And we use a lot of third-party tools, but we also use, we also have a lot of custom software. And right now we have about 20 uh, distinct executables running in production at any time. And we have started over the last year, year and a half to convert them to Spring Boot. Uh, we were doing everything manual before. So we were doing our own parent palms, we were doing our own custom libraries, we were doing our own deployment scripts, we were doing our own initialization and runtime scripts, we were doing everything ourselves. And we were spending more and more time working on that stuff than actually working on delivering features to our users. So we started to convert to uh, Spring Boot and we got a lot of benefit. We were able to get rid of a lot of that stuff. But we wanted to go further. So we wanted to start, we started having issues with configuration files. When you have 20 deployable units spread across and each one's deployed three or four times across servers, um, you do an upgrade on uh, a release and they update the configs on three or four of the services. And you have a standby service that comes up and it's got the wrong config. Um, service location was always a problem. We were hard coding endpoints in configuration files or we were having to do tickets to uh, upgrade uh, F5s all the time, um, updating C names, all that stuff. So what I wanted to do was say, well, what kind of solutions were we going to have or what can we have? Uh, and that's why we started looking at uh, console for service discovery and configuration management. Um, some of the goals to roll that you know, to this kind of solution was we wanted to reduce complexity. And not reducing complexity to a point where you're, where you're degrading the service, but reducing complexity and, either, and increasing the service. Uh, automate everything, and that's what everyone says, right? Automate everything. But we really wanted to be able to automate um, as much as we could. Um, excuse me. Um, so we wanted to be able to automate everything we could. And right now with the Spring Boot applications, we have a single deployable unit that we drop in any environment, but we still had to configure it, and we still had to do the location service. Um, and then standardization. Uh, working with Spring Boot and, and even with the service location, we're able to lay out a template and all the applications are able to use it. So now every single app looks the same to the developers and looks the same to the operations team. Um, we have a uh, follow the sun operations. So we can get different people touching these apps 24 hours a day. And they're not really familiar with all the applications, all the ins and outs, because they have other applications, other teams that they also support. And then lastly, adaptability. Whatever platform you're running on today, whether it's a white box, uh, private cloud, public cloud, containers, you're probably not going to be running on that same, same exact configuration in three years, or maybe even one year. Um, and what we wanted to do is create software, or engineer our software in such a way that we could be adaptable to those different environments. Oop. Here we go. So first, I want to just talk about some challenges. Um, and we'll go through this stuff quick, and we'll get to the code really quickly. I promise. Uh, so everywhere I've worked probably in the last five or six years, I've never had a manager come up and say, hire as many people as you need, get as many resources as you need. It's the mantra is always do more with less. And to be able to do more with less, we need to be able to automate and to be able to utilize the open source and the third party products that are out there versus doing it ourselves. Turnover. Turnover is just a fact of life. And when you have really clever people writing all sorts of custom software and then leaving, it's really hard to support that. And then uh, technology changing quickly. Um, I think in the last year, I've probably programmed in three or four different languages, um, including my basic base languages. And um, not to mention that, but different, different uh, platforms and different technologies coming out all the time. And then we'll talk about platform agility. And like I mentioned before, um, you, know, you need to be able to, when senior managers can make decisions in a lot of the bigger companies on where your stuff's going to run. And it's not necessarily the best platform for your software to run on, but it's going to be the best because of vendors, because of costs, because of a lot of different reasoning. And you have to be able to adapt for that. So you know, right now, we're running on VMs. But later on, we could be running on a, in a container on a VM. Then we could be running a container on private cloud on a VM and then public cloud. So we need our software to be able to adapt to that. And then also regulatory and compliance. So every time somebody logs on to a production box with, with a Fortune 500 company or a bank, it's a big deal. So if we can avoid that and cut down on that, it saves us a lot of headache. Oop, wrong button. There we go. 
So what I want to do and do this quickly is just we, I created a small Spring Boot application, or two Spring Boot applications that talk to each other. I'm just going to run through them really quickly because I know you saw that yesterday. And then what we're going to do is we're going to enhance them and add uh, in console to them. And so essentially, it's an invoice service that calls a tax service. The invoice service uh, is going to print out a line item and calls a tax service to calculate the tax. Um, very simple. This uh, you know, it's a toy application. And can you see that? So that's the uh, that's the Maven Palm. Uh, very simple. It has a couple dependencies and has the parent Palm. Nothing nothing special going on there. You don't really have to be able to read it. Oh, you can't read it, can you? So it has the web starter, it has uh, the actuator, um, and then it has a parent Palm for for Spring Boot. Nothing. And I have a lot of this code already on uh, Git if you, uh, later on if you guys want. And again, we have our main application just like John did yesterday with the uh, Spring Boot annotation and the start me uh, method. And essentially, it's a REST controller. Um, it imports the tax rate from a uh, applications.yaml file, and it does a calculation. You pass in a price, and it multiplies the two and returns the answer. Very, very simple. Um, and that's my application.yaml file. One of the things to notice is we're specifying the port in the application.yaml file. If I don't specify the port, it's going to go to port 8080. If I run two applications on the same server, they're going to conflict. So that's something that would have to be managed. And then the tax rate is also in that file. So now we're going to take that. Is everyone with me? Everyone understands the Spring Boot stuff, right? OK, good. So next, we're going to take that app and we're going to enhance it. Um, we're going to enhance it by uh, integrating it with Console. So this is from Console's website, and Console provides first-class support for uh, service discovery, health check, key value pairs, and multi-data center. So there's a lot of tools that you can use, and I've, I just selected Console because it really felt like a good fit for what I was trying to do. But you might already have tool, existing tooling. You might um, want to use Zookeeper for the key value pair instead, and that's fine. I think, I think the important part is actually getting the architecture in there and not actually the actual tool. So this is what it's going to look like when we add console. So we're still going to have the invoice service talking to the tax service. Um, but it's going to go to console to find the location of that first. Console is going to do health checks on all my endpoints for me. So we're going to have a console agent running on every box. And um, all of our services are going to register with console, and then console will do health checks. Um, any queries going to console, console will run stateless, will go to the console servers. So you're going to have like three console servers running per data center, three to five. And they will uh, elect a leader. And that leader will, uh, will be the one where, where all the writes go, and then everything else is replicated out. OK. So, yes? Console, yeah, agent will be running on all the machines. Well, all your apps, yes. But then the servers, you could put them on the same box, but um, essentially you want three to five per data center. OK. It's very, very similar. So again, you, could, you can slide in different technologies here. Um, but we'll get, once, once you see how, the, how we annotate the app and get it going, you'll see how you can just swap in different apps. I mean, I don't go through that here, but you'll be able to figure out how to do that. Um, OK, so we have our basic Spring Boot application. It's going to start up. It's going to call to console for its configuration. Um, then it's going to register itself as a serv uh, It's going to do service registration, so it's a here I am. It's going to do service discovery of anything it needs, and we're also going to be doing health checks. It's actually console is going to be calling into uh, the Spring Boot applications doing the health checks. OK, so what are some of the advantages of, of having this kind of setup? And since I, do, uh, I am on a systems management team, um, first thing is th or that I'm going to talk about is monitoring, so discovering services to monitor. So right now, we have to instrument every app, every app instance that we run. But with console, I can actually go to a single console node, pull all the services down, and then since we're using Spring Boot, I know my actuator endpoints. I can call those actuator endpoints and start to monitor, gather metrics and monitoring statistics on those applications. And since the uh, developers can, can set up custom actuator uh, metrics, I, all that stuff starts to get pulled in. And we're actually setting up a separate service called Metrics as a Service, where we'll be able to dump all that stuff into a database and then be able to graph it um, for them. So uh, OK, so the next thing is 
I care more about the health of a service than the health of a service instance. And today, I care about the service instance health. So if I'm running three instances of a service and one all of a sudden goes down, my alarm's going off, my uh, operations is calling, they're calling us in the middle of the night, we've got to get this going. If I have three or four services and one goes down, but my rule says as long as I have two or three, I'm good to go, I care more about the service than the actual instance of the service. And, and that's really moving us more towards a cloud uh, mentality where I don't care what box my, things, my, compute, my uh, service is running on when I, when I provision a, uh, a cloud server. And here, I don't really care about the actual serv uh, service instance. I only care about that the service is available. Development, uh, or deployment, I'm sorry. Start order doesn't matter. So we definitely have applications in the past where we had to start them in a certain order and it was a secret sauce. And we had to get our NIPD scripts perfect so that everything started up or it failed and you know, we got the calls in the middle of the night again. Uh, simplifying deployment. You know, with this, I'm not gonna have a properties file to deploy with. So that means I have a single war or jar file that I'm deploying that's the same in dev, UAT, and production. It's one file to drop to the disk. And you could script it with Puppet, you could script it with Ansible, or you could write a shell script that does a wget and pulls a file down and then calls install on it. Um, separation of environments. We recommend, especially if you're a bigger organization, that you have a separate console cluster for production and non-production. And the beauty of that is, is once you're on a production box, you're only gonna talk to the production console cluster, and you're only going to get production endpoints. So you're not going to have somebody messed up a property, is, and now they're, they're all attaching from development to production, or the other way around. You can also run console in, uh, in dev mode, and it only, it'll run local in your box only. And that gives you that isolation, but you get to still test all the features. And OK, so for configuration, so we already said no local configuration files. Also, you can update at runtime. Now, this is a feature that I'm a little mixed on. Um, it's possible. You have to add an annotation to be able to do it. I wouldn't do it everywhere um, for obvious reasons. But you can actually go into console's UI, change the property. It will push it out in runtime. Spring Boot will recreate that bean for you and insert it back in. And dynamic discovery of endpoints. So this is a really easy way to do HA. So if I call an endpoint and it dies or it's not there anymore, it's going to automatically load another endpoint. Um, this is also a way to do things like upgrading. So if I have to migrate to a new box, I can set the services up on the new box, shut them down on the old box, everything will fail over to the new box seamlessly. Uh, it's also a standard way of doing it. Uh, so all the, you know, if you have multiple teams doing this, operations teams know exactly how to do it, they know how to roll back the other way. All right, so this is the same problem that we had. I'm gonna go into the code now and show how we're gonna set up console. This is the same exact uh, problem we had, except for we added the uh, Spring Cloud Starter Console All dependency. Is that even legible at all? Yeah, OK. So it's not actually a Spring Boot um, package per se. It's part of Spring, uh, Spring Cloud. But essentially, it's going to add the dependencies. And as soon as you add this, depend this dependency, it's going to start looking for the configurations on console. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, yes. Let me talk about. I'm sorry. Yes. So, console is made by a company called HashiCorp, um, and they they do um, data center automation tools, and they have a lot of really interesting tools, uh, and console is just one of them. And um, the Spring Cloud has an integration between uh, Spring Boot and console, and that's what we're leveraging here. Thank you. So now the, the, I'm going to add an annotation to my uh, to my application, and it's enable discovery client. And that's going to allow me to discover endpoints. Now here, for this app, for this uh, for the controller, I added refresh scope. So that means in console, whenever I change the tax rate, it's going to uh, essentially what it does is it creates a proxy uh, around this class, and all calls in go to the proxy and say, "Please give me the current version." As soon as you load up, as soon as you change that tax rate, it's going to take the cached version of the, uh, of the uh, class, throw it away, and put a new one in. So all your old calls will re will resolve properly, but the next call in will get the new instance with the new uh, tax rate. Here we go. OK, so now we throw out the application.yaml. We don't have that any longer. But we have another configuration file. But this one we can build into the application because it's not going to change. So the first thing we're saying is enable watch. So it's going to be querying console. 
for changes for us. Um, the next thing is the console port. And that's the one thing we are going to hard code, and that's our bootstrap, right? So we're going to run console on every box on port 8500. I mean, obviously, you can pick a different port, but right here, that's where we're picking is 8500. Um, next thing is register health check true. So when you do register health check true, it sends the health URL from your application to console, and console uses that health URL to actually check the health of your application. And they also do a basic check on your application on the process. Now, the nice thing is you can actually extend that health check. Um, if you implement the, uh, the base class or the interface for the health check, it'll add that to your health check. So you can do it. Now, it's going to do it several times a minute, and you don't necessarily want to make something super uh, increase incredibly heavy. But you can do a lightweight health check, and you can extend the health check. Now, the instance ID and, and the port number are, are interesting. So by default, you don't have to set the instance ID. Um, the library will do it itself. And what it does is it uses the application instance name and the port number, but, which is great, right? And it's, a, it's, it's a by host level, so it's, it is pretty unique, except for the fact that I want to use port 0 because I want to let Spring assign the uh, port. And when I do that, it uses port 0 as the instance ID. And if I run two services on the same box, I will get the same name and the same port number, and they will conflict. So I overrode the instance ID to actually put a random number in there. Now, having, you know, bringing up services and not knowing what port they're going to run on is usually a problem. But since they're registering with console and I'm going to be getting my endpoints from console, it's not a problem any longer. So if I want to access the tax service, I go to console and say tax service, and it gives me the connection to, the, to console. I don't have to know the port and the host any longer. OK, and this is how I would call that, that RESTful service before without console. Um, I would have a REST template, and I would put the host in the port, and then I put the URL, and I put back what I'm expecting back, and I can pass my parameters, right? We've all done that. Here, I'm actually putting the name of the service, and that's it. And now I'm going to be able to resolve to the service. If it fails, I will fail over to another service. If that's not there, I will get an error saying tax service is now not available. And I'm a big fan of clear, clear uh, error message. Again, especially in the middle of the night when someone's calling you up. And... OK, so this is a picture of the console. This is a picture of uh, the console user interface. User interfaces is definitely not one of their strong suits. Um, so essentially, you can put the properties almost anywhere you like. But the convention that's set up by the integration is it's going to put it in a directory called config, then the application name, and then the property. So here you'll see config, and then you'll see uh, Spring Day's tax service, which I actually changed in the app to just tax service, and then the tax rate. And then I think you can see that it's 0, .0 something, something, something. So all of the properties are organized by, by application, and they all fall under the config directory. And then you can see here, it's, I'm listing all of the services. So you can list all the services, all the endpoints that are available. So setting up console, like I said before, you need at least uh, three, three servers running for a cluster to, start, to establish quorum. Every host must run a console agent. If you turn the console agent off, bad things happen. Um, agents are stateless, and they forward all the requests to the server. Same executable is used, so it's a single executable like Executable that can be used for server or agent. And we talked about the production, non-production. And then for development, we're going to use console, agent, minus dev, minus UI. And that's going to, uh, that's going to bring up a, uh, a console agent for development, which, is, uh, which I really like because I can, I can break out the development environments without stepping on each other. So now we're going to show you some of the stuff. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is start console. So again, console agent, I'm going to start it in dev because I'm not running a cluster on my laptop. This pretty much kills it when I run all this stuff. And I found an interesting bug last night when I was going through it without internet. Um, it doesn't like that. It actually uses the Mac address or the, uh, the Mac's um, name, and console does not like that and will fail. But uh, OK, so I'm going to run these from Eclipse so we can kind of see them better, I'm hoping. So I'm going to start up. Actually, let me sh I'm going to start up the uh, tax demo. Oh, let's 
going here. And it's going to fail in a second. Oh, it failed. And because I don't have my tax rate in there. So we're going to add that. So I'm going to go to key value pair here. Everything available in console is also available through, uh, through web services and command line. So you won't have necessarily people sitting there typing this at deployment time. Let's kill that. Okay, so now it's got its value and it's all, it's all ready to go. So we're going to add the properties for the next service and start that up real quick. And one more property and we're done. All right, so we're going to start an invoice service up. One thing I want to show you with the invoice service is here's the, uh, the REST template that I have for calling it. Can you guys, is that visible or should I make it bigger? There we go. And the one thing we added was load, was load balance. And that's going to tell it to uh, keep retrying. It's not a true load balancer. It's not going to keep switching between each time. But if it fails, it will switch. Um, there are ways to do load balancing with this. Um, you could use um, HA proxy and integrate that. Or um, you could actually query console, pull the endpoints out, and put them into like an F5 configuration or something like that if that's what you wanted to use. And they're allowing you to do that. So there's different ways to utilize this stuff. But let's go ahead and start this up. Now, I don't know where any of these endpoints are, so I'm going to have to look them up. We can make this big now. So I'm going to look at the services here. Oop, just wait a second for it to register. OK, there. So I have my invoice service and my tax service. So let's say I want to call my invoice service. So first thing you can notice is uh, it has the uh, served health check, which is their basic health check. And then it actually has right here, I don't know if you can see that, it has the, uh, the spring boot health check. Let's see if we can get that. And that's the basic health check for the Spring Boot. So that's what it's calling every periodically. Now we're going to go on the same port. And we're going to put a, a quantity in. So it will say 100. So essentially, it tells you you bought 100 products at 19.99. That was the price that we entered. Um, and your total is 19.99. And then it figures out the tax and then the total. Let's say we wanted to uh, change the tax rate. Tax rate. And we're going to make the tax rate really big here. So that's about a 1,000% th tax. Now, what we'll see is we'll see it actually calling into here. Refresh the refresh listener there, and then we should. And then the tax, it tells you that the tax rate changed. Oop, did I go too far? There we go. So now when we go to rerun our service, 
right? So it pushed it pushed the property. Through. Obviously, storing things like numbers, like tax rates and prices, is silly to put into a console. You're going to have more configuration type stuff in there. Um, tax rates and the prices are going to be in a, in a product database. But you get the point that we can update these things in production if we want to. Yeah, you can put JSON in there. Is that what you mean? Or you can put multiple. Oh, you mean like you can put anything you want and then break it, right? Is that what you mean like lists and stuff like that? Maps? Oh, uh, well, I mean, like like I said, I wouldn't use, I would have a tax database. No, no, I'm just giving you an example. Oh, okay. Something, uh, I mean, I'm just thinking about it. Uh, okay. For some cases. I'm just seeing, uh, trying to see if it would be able to support multiple values. You can put a JSON value, object in there with multiple values in, in. you could put uh, multiple values separately. You could probably put a comma delineated comma delineated a list in there and then parse it. Um, so there's, there's different ways to do it. Um, but yeah, you, you can, there's all sorts, of, yeah, you can do that. And most likely what we're going to do is we're going to script the, proper, the properties going in the console. And I don't know that I, like I said, I don't know that I'm going to be doing dynamic changes of properties in console in production. Um, but I, what I like is that I'm configuring a service, not configuring an instance of the service. So, and like I said, we've all had where we have a uh, standby DR site, you bring it up and nobody's updated the properties files in five years. Uh, uh, but this is nice because it's going to call in the co console and it's going to get the same properties. So you're configuring it once and then when you start up on a new deployment, if you do it wrong, it's going to give you an error and you're going to know. But any, any instance of that service will get the same exact properties. Um, let's say you don't have a Java application or you don't have a Spring Boot application. You can actually write a script on startup that calls, queries the properties, and writes them to a property file for you. Um, not as elegant, but, but it can definitely work. Um, but yeah, definitely, um, as far as processes and, and operations, they're going to they're gonna be a little leery of this stuff. But with the coming of all the cloud technologies, I don't think, you know, like right now you spin up two instances. It's not a big deal. What if you spin up 30 instances? You know, like you, we need solutions to be able to go out there and not have to go and hop onto 30 um, Docker containers that we just spun up and, and write config files. Um, some people use Hira data or they'll use different solutions. Um, I just chose this because it's a nice unified solution, something that I can use one tool and get you know, kind of what I needed out of it. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's kill our tax rate service here. No, the, there is no application of properties anymore. So we're putting port zero which tells Spring Boot, you pick the port number. Now, the service, when it registers with console, it does it properly. Yeah. So it uses the proper port, whatever that port might be. But when it actually builds the unique ID, it uses the zero port instead of the actual real port. Right, so, but yeah, from console, they don't, they don't know there's any association between the application instance and the port ID. So we kill this guy, and my computer is really slow, so it actually takes things longer to die than it does to start. There it goes. And we will refresh here. And it's not going to work eventually. Mm -hmm. What's that? There, oh, there we go. All right. So we failed. It didn't work. If we go back, we're going to get the error instance not available tax service. So I am going to start up a new tax service. And we'll be able to see that register. And I could have run two or three tax services and not had it fail at all if I had multiples running at one time. And we are back in business. And we can refresh here. And, and again, the new service now is running on a completely different port, so it's not the same port at all. 
There we go. Uh, okay, and it's back. Right. So yeah, architecturally, from if I'm drawing boxes on, on a piece of paper, it's going to look the same. But look at this from a developer's point of view now, I control the health check. And I control the health check with, with the F5 also, but you know, that's not something that you enhance with every release, right? Uh, or maybe you do, but most, most people don't. Um, also, like we do tickets to add things to F5s now. Um, if you have a load balancer, that's fine to still use this in it, but I would want to automate. I want to automate everything, right? I don't want uh, to have to have somebody manually go in and edit this and edit that. And with this, I'm automating my health check and I'm automating my registration of the service. And I'm automating my deregistration of the service. Um, so now this is making me more agile, and more ready for things like, hey, your company's going to roll out a private cloud. And I want to spin up, I know that at 8 o'clock in the morning, my busiest time, I want to roll, I want to spin up six more instances. But I know by noon, I don't need them anymore, and I want to, I want to put them back, I want to give them back, and I don't want to pay for them anymore. So, you, you know, like, I mean, for us right now, that means I'm doing tickets every day, and it's never going to happen. Um, but yeah, architecturally, it's essentially the same thing, but you're, do, you're automating it. And, and now, when we automate things like that, we make it easy to do the right thing. Well, right here, what we demoed was, yeah, going into the UI and changing the property. Um, you could push properties with, through web service call or through, uh, or through the command line. Um, I guess, you know, you could put something to hook it up to a database. Um, but, you know, yeah, I think, I think we have to be careful about how much we customize the solution versus getting the right solution. Because, again, now you're maintaining something like that. And one of the things I like about solutions like this is there's a lot of eyes on it. Um, you know, I used to say, like, Log4J, like, not one person wrote Log4J. I used to go to the discussion forums, and there would be 10 pages of discussions on a single line of code. You know, no, no one developer came up with all that stuff. Oh, let me think. I think that's it. I just have one final slide. All right, I got to get a faster laptop. Okay, well... Well, there we go. So this is just, I have the code on uh, GitHub if anyone wants to code. Again, there wasn't a lot of code, so I didn't, I was planning on doing a little live coding, but there was essentially no live coding to do. Um, and then the console website has a lot of good resources, and of course, the uh, Spring Cloud. Um, I think we have a few minutes left if anyone has any questions. Any more questions? Um, you, I think there are plugins to be able to do, go to Git and that type of thing and pull things in and put them in into the console. Um, or you can write a script that can pull from there and, and update console. Yeah, just trying to um, compare it with like Spring config server. Yeah. Where there's a, a tie-up with your version. So you, have, you would have a prompt version, a dev version. Yeah, I, I would think so, yeah. And like I, like I said, I like to keep everything in, separate because we've all had that problem where we cross environments right. and bad things happen. Anyone else? Can you talk about the bad things Oh, I'm sorry, bad things that happen when, when I mix up environments, not with console. Well, all right, well, with, with instance, what happens when console has an outage and you lose an agent? Like, how resilient? Right, that's, that's a good point. If you lose an agent, you're essentially going to lose a node or the box. Um, if you get split brain, you're going to lose the part of the network that, that, that is split off. I mean, and that, that's going to happen with any, uh, but yeah, those, and, those, and that's the risk, right? If, if your console cluster comes down, you're going to be in trouble, right? But, uh, yes? It, no, um, what we did was we put port zero to tell Spring to select the port, and it will have two random ports essentially that don't that are available on that box. It'll get one. It'll get one of them. It'll it'll cache the same instance until there's an issue, and then it'll fall over to the other one. Now, there are load balancing technologies you can put in there if you want different load balancing, like HA proxy for client side. Yeah, 
If I wanted to use it in my public API, I would load balance off of the web apps and then have this on the back end. Yeah, I wouldn't expose this. You, you can in console. The library right now doesn't support it, but I imagine that that will be being added because I think that is a really good uh, feature to have. Because again, we don't want to repeat ourselves with the property if, if everyone's connecting to the same server or serve, you know, server. Now, another way to do it is actually use uh, console to use to, instead of everyone accessing that property, you kind of say, well, why are we all accessing that property? And is there a service that we could build out to provide that service, right? Like, like there, there, there's questions to be asked. Oh, one thing I did not mention is console can also act as a DNS server. So you could register your databases with that and then give distinct database names to go to console and then it'll figure out and connect to like your MySQL database. But uh, yeah, I think the hierarchical property thing definitely like a hero data type thing. I think it gets very complicated though also because now you have to decide how am I going to have, have my hierarchy working and do I do it first by region and then by environment or by environment then region. Um, and one of the things I do like about this is it is simple, but then you do have the uh, if you have the same property and for you know configured for 70 server 70 distinct services that could be an issue so it seems like console is trying to integrate trying to take on the logic of the website mm -hmm. the console is is uh, trying to do like local activity right yes Yeah, so the, they recommend at least three console servers per data center. You can run five. Um, they have to start establish quorum. So, so your servers are going to be up there. Now, your agent is very, very lightweight, so it's not doing a lot of heavy lifting, and it shouldn't really crash. But if your agent goes down, it would have to be restarted for your services to work, um, but only on that box. Now, you should be spreading your services across multiple boxes, right? They actually have, and I haven't talked about it here, um, but they actually have the ability to do data center failovers, and then they'll, they'll bridge across the data centers for you. So, I mean, yeah, the guys at HashiCorp, they're, they're really into doing the infrastructure level open source development. So they, it's really, it's, um, take a look at that, but on the website, but it is, um, but yeah, they do have that ability. Yep. And one of the things I really like about this is now I have the same patterns. If I have 20 application teams using this stuff, they're all following the same HA pattern, DR pattern, um, roll forward pattern, roll back patterns. So now I have one runbook, and they just put their name on it and the name of their app maybe. And, and you know, everything else is, is the same. Oop. OK, I think that's it. Thank you.